So yes, welcome to, for this semester, the final talk on critical perspectives on technology. Uh, my name is Katja Spiel and I'm a FWF Hertha Firmberg postdoctoral scholar at TU Wien, where I research marginalized perspectives on technology to inform critical design and engineering. My pronouns are they, them, and my sign name is. This lecture series um, is a part of my research project on exceptional norms, marginalized bodies in interaction design, and supported by the Human Computer Interaction Group at TUV. I want to do a quick access check in. So you do have, um, you do have uh, uh, sign interpretation, um, which is in the, um, you can find them, their co-hosts in the participant list. And this is what their name is. It's in Austrian sign language. There is also uh, automated captioning, a live transcript uh, from, like that is automatically done, not by a human, available to you. And uh, if I may, I would also provide the script and the uh, slides in the chat right now. And you can follow along. But please respect the speaker's work and labor in doing those and uh, doing them especially specifically for us uh, and don't share them without consent um, outside of this event. All right. So. If you have any other needs, uh, even if they arise like spontaneously, just let me know either directly chatting to me um, or just generally using the chat. Anyway, today you are here to hear from Reem. Reem Tohuk, pronouns are she, her, is a Lebanese postdoctoral research fellow in the School of Design and the Center of International Development at Northumbria University. She is also the co-director along with Dr. Angelica Strohmeyer at the Design Feminisms uh, Research Group and an affiliate of the Center for Population and Health at the American University of Beirut. Uh, Angelica, you have, by the way, met in uh, an earlier installation of this series. Um, she has, uh, Reem has conducted research in humanitarian contexts in the Middle East Europe and Australia, designing technologies for resilience with refugees and asylum seekers. More recently, she has begun an exploration at the intersection of design, decoloniality, global social justice, and humanitarianism in an effort to shift narratives of innovation and the ways in which refugees and minoritized people are configured within them. Her presentation is titled decolonizing design within colonized worlds. So you can ask questions during and after the presentation in the chat window or however Reem tells you to. And afterwards, we will all be in a discussion led by Deborah Leal, who is Brazilian and a research associate at the University of Siegen in Germany. Her research Focuses, uh, uh, her research focuses on the role of digital technologies in rural communities in the Brazilian Amazon region and the tension between these technologies and coloniality. But for now, Reem, take it away. Thank you, Kata, for inviting me to today's talk. So as Kata said, I am uh, Reem Talhu, a Lebanese postdoctoral researcher in design and international development at Northumbria University in the UK. My research has mainly explored the design of technologies with refugees and asylum seekers within humanitarian contexts in Lebanon, the Urdun, Europe, and Australia. Here is what I am not. I am not an expert in decoloniality but rather a researcher undergoing a process of unlearning and learning. So you can imagine that after sending Kata the title of my talk, I had a little panic attack about what will I say? How will my academic vulnerability be perceived? But I recalled Catherine E. Walsh, 
writing about her time with the Zapatista movement, a community and way of being that has contributed thought and done with decolonial researchers and thinkers. In her writing, Walsh talks about humility in the unlearning and learning process. She has also poignantly said, decoloniality is also not a condition of illumination or enlightenment that some possess and others do not. Such assumption sets the stage for intellectual disputes over who is more decolonial. And so I decided for this talk, I will hold my humility and vulnerability in both hands. As I talk with you about my ongo ongoing learning and unlearning process, in the hope that our discussions will be reflexive, challenging, and caring. The reason I wanted to talk about this topic is because it is within the humanitarian system and research, forced migration due to conflict and refugee communities, that the colonial matrix of power, epistemic violence, coloniality, modernity, decoloniality, and the role that technologies and design play or can play are very evident. Throughout this talk, I will be placing the humanitarian system, research, technologies, and their designs in dialogue with coloniality and decoloniality. Very much drawing on Anibal Kujano's work on the colonial matrix of power, Fernando Flores Winnegard, Terry Winnegard, and Anne Marie Willis's work on designing ontologically and world making. Tony Fry's work on futuring, Ansari's work in relation to interlocutors, Arturo Escobar's work on plurality and design, and Mignola and Walsh's work on decolonial practice in relation to the dyad of coloniality modernity, and many others. I will also be talking about the decolonial cracks as presented by Catherine E. Walsh within the spaces in which I work and have worked. In his work on Orientalism, Edward Saad analyzes Balfour's speech to the British Parliament regarding the Egyptian colony, where Balfour talks about how they, the British Empire, know more about Egyptian civilization than the Egyptians do. And as such, they are the best people to govern it. Sad then draws parallels to how the Orient has been and still is constructed as a world of field of study, world and field of study and intervention. Nawal Zainab, proper, more popularly known as Nawal Sadawi, talks about how we cannot undo the patriarchy under the guise of development and white feminism, as the patriarchy imperialism, colonialism, neo-colonialism, nationalism, and religious fundamentalisms interchange as two sides of the same coin, creating contradictions that further subjugation to power in service of profit. This is also shown in examinations of the humanitarian system. In the edited book, Empire, Development, and Colonialism, Authors draw parallels and lines of continuation between 19th century techniques of governing the colonies to techniques and technologies in humanitarian intervention and development. From drawing new borders, the expansion of the development businesses and the roles assigned to NGO workers. However, we do not need to delve far into books to see the continuity of colonialism. Look at what is currently happening in Palestine, Lebanon, Iraq, and other parts of the world. In a recent study that I conducted in collaboration with Aline Jeremani, Hala Ghattas, at the American University of Beirut, and Sara Armouche, and Angelica Strohmeyer, we wanted to look into how we can go about designing for health equity in the context of compounded crises and the Lebanese revolution. Participants that included Lebanese activists and NGO workers all highlighted how the system has been designed for them to be in service to international funders that define to them what is good humanitarian response and development. 
And that is how that is a barrier to equity, not just in terms of health service provision, but also in terms of the social tensions between refugees and Lebanese they are all experiencing poverty and oppression. By looking at this through the colonial matrix of power, we can see how despite the SDGs localization agenda, the colonial power asymmetries and Orientalism remain. But that example also brings to the fore the dyad of coloniality modernity, where Euro modernity is the belief in the individual, in the real, in science, and in the economy as self constituted entities. That coloniality has pushed as the only horizon we should be working towards. As such, coloniality has been referred to as the darker side of modernity. And development theories have furthered this narrative of one way of being. Economies need to develop, grow, and modernize for people to progress socially and politically. And that is the only viable future. In doing so, global development theories and practice remove other ways of being and futures of our worlds. After the Beirut port explosion, Macron visited, the Le Le visited Lebanon along with French businessmen. And some Lebanese started a petition asking for Lebanon to become a colony again. I cried that day. As much as I cried when the explosion happened, because his visit, the response of some Lebanese, and the title of this article lay bare an instance of power within the colonial matrix and that the ruler, France, is exercising power through and with the Lebanese political and economic interlocutors that caused the explosion. And as painfully, the petition is a manifestation of the challenges in imagining a future way of being that is not colonial or in an image of France and the West. And Fry talks about how coloniality, modernity contributes to defuturing, taking people's ability to imagine and create futures otherwise. And here it is very evident. In my work with refugees, the tools for enforcing a way of being also becomes evident. Let's take this case of Syrian refugees that had begun demanding a world otherwise. How otherwise, we will never know. And we're forced to flee because of that. Once people are refugees, they become subjects to no one and everyone. In many ways, being stateless is a break away from coloniality and its understanding of nation states that were not present pre-Western colonialism. So you would imagine that as people flee because they are fighting one way of being, they may work towards being otherwise. However, their statelessness is governed by the humanitarian aid system and technologies of control, such as camps. For border culture, as presented by Gloria and Zalat Doa, and further argued by Bignolo and Walsh, are the interior roots of modernity coloniality and the consequences of international law and global linear thinking. Encampment and non-encampment of refugees is very intimately tied with capitalism in that in contexts where fragmented economic elites can profit off of cheap and unjust labor, refugees are not assigned to formal camps. In other contexts with more state-controlled capitalist economies, they are encamped and directed towards specific industrial spaces. In Urdun, Sarah Nabil and I worked on the project looking into the design of private and public places in Zaatari refugee camp. And one of the things refugees told us is that when they arrived to the camp, the spaces in which they were assigned to live in were set up into blocks. And they were assigned to these blocks based on where they are from with restrictions to mobility. Now, not only was living in blocks not aligned with their way of being, but control over mobility also controls refugees' ability to work together and an interculturality towards new ways of being. And this extends to the designs of humanitarian technologies. 
For example, when working with Syrian refugee community in Lebanon, we explored food aid technologies, which is a growing space for humanitarian design and innovation. Through co-constructing shared narratives of their experiences with the aid system, it becomes clear how current technologies are in use in forced coloniality and modernity in a specific way of being. As the technology is designed for the individual and household and contributes to decreasing refugee agency in their interactions with the aid system and the other actors, it is designed to protect how food aid is used that does not account for their communal values and practices. As such, the technology not only enforces being only a beneficiary of aid on refugees, but it also limits the space of being communal. This is not to say that there are no tensions within the refugee community I worked with, and indeed there were sub-communities. But how are refugees supposed to explore new ways of being in inculturality and conviviality to other communities and their respective ways of being if the way of being enforced on them is that of the individual and household? Now, after highlighting the intertwining of coloniality and modernity within the colonial matrix of power in refugee contexts and the, des and the design of the humanitarian system, I would like to turn to the decolonial cracks within them, starting from the academy, the humanitarian system, and refugee spaces. Decoloniality is not a new paradigm or mode of critical thought. It is a way, an option, standpoint, analytic, project, practice, and praxis. A praxis within colonial modernity power matrix that has the power to undermine it. It is not an abstract universal, it is pluriversal, and that there are multiple ways of being, worlds and futures that can coexist. Decoloniality is a pluriversity of undoing and redoing, it is epistemic, reconstitution, it is resisting and re-existing otherwise. While some question if decoloniality can or should even exist within academia, Given academia's epistemic violence, racism, and whiteness, Walsh talks about decolonial cracks and fissures in which we exist within colonial spaces that we can seek to expand. I'm currently co-chairing with Andy Dearden PDC Places as part of the 2022 Participatory Design Conference. And the idea is to have a decentralized conference that is shaped by local organizers in their and their communities' visions of being and knowledge generation. In doing so, we hope to create spaces for epistemic plurality. And the response has been amazing. We have designers and researchers from all lands proposing activities, dialogues, and making. This for me is a decolonial crack, but it's not without its tensions, ebbs and flows that sometimes seem like they will narrow the crack. The first tension was around how do we include the conference publications within activities in PTC places so that attendees are in dialogue with the research? And how do we do that without enforcing a Western academic structure for knowledge sharing onto PTC places? We posed this tension to organizers that so had so far planned locally oriented activities around exploring participatory design and artism making with communities they work with and local academic communities. And the tension was palpable in the Zoom room as we discussed it. We asked organizers to reflect on the issue, discuss it in their teams and come back to us with ideas. And they did. We have instances where organizers are proposing to select from conference papers and video presentations that are relative, relevant to them and their communities and integrate them into dedicated activities. And others that intend to integrate them and their authors into the activities that they had already planned in a dialogical manner. They are placing knowledge in relationality. The other tension is related to willingness to sacrifice and make space for decolonial cracks. While organizers from, pre, from colonized worlds 
have embraced the idea of a decentralized conference and highlighted the value of it in terms of access and exploration of how we can do conferences otherwise. Some, but not all, from affluent locations expressed hesitance in taking on what is a demanding endeavor. They voiced concerns regarding the lack of clarity of how the endeavor benefits their institutions. Coloniality modernity became apparent as academic competition and individualization lurked its head. And it's not that this is not something I understand. I do. We are all working within a precarious system that rewards getting ahead rather than solidarity and the ability of multiple worlds to exist and flourish. And so I posed and still pose the question to them. Do we as a participatory design community not see value in creating space for participation otherwise? Value in the epistemologies and practices that are entering in dialogue with another? If yes, then should we not make sacrifices? And here I'm not saying that it's on them to decolonize the conference, but to consider the world we are enforcing through our refusal of sacrifice. We are still holding this tension with sadness and care and with the hope that creativity will emerge as we all collectively try to tackle it. Because like I said, it is not them as academics that are narrowing the decolonial crack, but rather the academic system that provides no space for sacrifices. Another example is from within my institution. I am the design lead for a global development futures initiative at the university. All the academics are brilliant scholars and the lead is a wonderful human being that has been working in the cracks of humanitarian systems and academia. So when we met to start thinking of the initiatives of the initiative steering committee, I said, well, our steering committee should surely consist of members of the communities we work with and our partners in Lebanon, Uganda, Brazil, Bangladesh, India. For who else to better steer us, challenge us with care and be in dialogue with our praxis than them? And everyone agreed and we started the list. Halfway through compiling the list, the decolonial crack we wanted to fix within our colonial academic structure, modernity and coloniality came into play. Halfway through, the challenge of successfully getting grants came up and we stopped compiling our, our list because we realized that, that if the steering committee is to be oriented towards getting grants, which is what our institution will be using to measure success, then it will be by default consisting of world leading individuals in the humanitarian system that are typically from the West. This is not to say that they may not be proponents of decoloniality, but we quickly realized that the system is forcing us to prioritize them, their knowledge and the ways of being that accompany them over the people we work with and their values and knowledge. And that did not sit right with us. So we have now tabled the discussion as we take our time to talk to our institution and consider how we can reopen that crack. Revisiting the study conducted on health equity in Lebanon, coupled with a study I'm working on with Sara Armouche on the Lebanese revolution and Lebanese diaspora, we see the existence of the beginnings of decolonial cracks. For example, Delil Tadamun, translated as Solidarity Manual Index, is a movement promoting small, local, environmentally sustainable economies that work in solidarity with one another. Are they motivated by decoloniality? Well, I'm not sure. And it's something I'm hoping to explore with them. But it is a push for a new political imaginary as termed by Kareem Kumar that gives me hope. But the Lebanese revolution is not void of coloniality and modernity. In interviews with Lebanese diaspora involved in the revolution, we had one participant say that Lebanese in Lebanon need the diaspora as we the diaspora live in the West and know democracy. In interviews with Lebanese activists, some of them that are in the process of forming oppositional political movements and parties that are demanding being otherwise, highlighted how currently they're only working to support Lebanese 
and not Syrian refugees. Not that they did not believe that refugees should have rights and live in dignity, but because of the social tensions and identity being tied to the state. This data is alarming as it shows the potential of horizontal violence as presented by Frere. As in the process of liberating themselves, such movements may exclude refugees. And in doing so, the worlds that they want to build that can exist in interculturality of that of others that have relations to the land. And so as designers within that space, we need to question how we can work with those that are making cracks, not to enlighten them about decoloniality, for that's not possible. And one can only decolonially liberate themselves, but to design with them for a pluriversal crack. Going back to the work with refugee communities, the camps are not void of decolonial cracks. Indeed, Sarah Nabil's work um, and my work in Zatari camp also showed how refugees at night, when the presence of NGO workers are minimal, would move around the structures they lived in so that they can facilitate being with extended family and being communal. This disrupted the block system and NGO workers the next day would come back and put them back into blocks. And at night, refugees would move them again. And it kept happening until UHCR decided to work on redesigning the camp with refugees. Refugees had started using pipes that the UNHCR wanted to throw away to make decorations in their gardens and painting private and public spaces in their visions of what the world they want to live in should look like with flourishing greenery, clean rivers, and so on. Now, let's not forget that refugees are still living in a structure of control, in poor living conditions. But this is still a crack that refugees created and pushed into a fissure within the system that we can work in and widen. In the case of food aid technologies, we work together to design, a humanitarian, to design humanitarian food aid otherwise, that embedded refugee values and practices and how they envisioned being active agents that negotiate with other actors. Through a mock-up study, participants explored how they can take collective action in the form of collective purchasing, how, would, how they would engage with other sub-communities and what are the affordances of the communal. And while the technology was never developed, Throughout the mock-up study, participants took decisions on how they would act together to engage in interactions that they wanted to engage in. We can view this as a crack in which refugees are taking the tools that control them and creating workarounds that are of their way of being. And we see those cracks expanding into the humanitarian system. I have recently put in a research bid where for the first time, a humanitarian organization I had previously worked with has signed off on re-examining how they do design and innovation and how that can be changed into re in relation to structural inequalities and also the future visions for refugees ways of being. They would not have been able to sign off on it two years ago. The research will work with communities, local innovators, designers and makers and humanitarian organizations to redesign the way design and innovation is done and exists within the system. And Duffield rightfully pointed out to me that the project has interlocutors being the humanitarian innovators. And my response, which was echoed by local innovators on the bid was yes. And we can't wait to sit and work with the tensions to design otherwise. And it is within the process of humanitarian design and innovation that I hope we can design for decolonial cracks and fissures in the system. What I have talked about so far is a result of process of a process of learning and unlearning. And I do not want to refer to it as my process for it was being done in dialogue with others. And I hope that our conversation will be part of it. So now I want to talk about that journey in relation to Leon Musavi's recent article on jumping onto the decolonial bandwagon and the dangers of intellectual decolonization. 
I would not akin the process of learning and unlearning as a colonized self as jump but rather it has been and still is a process of anger, painful emotions and hope. If I want to extend the concept of decolonial cracks it is akin to a process of opening the cracks within ourselves and our epistemologies, which also often overlap with traumatic wounds and widening them. And that takes time and requires space to do so. Reading about decoloniality at first made me very uncomfortable and emotion, emotional. I couldn't understand why. So I ended up calling my good friend Joel Shufani, who is a PhD student in anthropology at George Washington University, to vent and just talk. And she was having the same feelings. So we reflected on where this source of discomfort comes from within ourselves. And we discussed how it's related to the challenge of unlearning and learning when our angry colonized selves do not have the tools and knowledge to do so. I link our first conversation to Mignolo and Walsh's words on how as, as individuals, we are responsible for our own decolonial liberation. Joelle and I realized that we are missing the language and knowledge of what we even want to be in dialogue with. Because both of us, having grown up in Lebanon and the Arab Gulf, had had instilled in us early on that Arabic is a dead language. And that to be successful in life, we need to be excellent in English. So how are we to read literary works, history and philosophies from our region? Don't get me wrong, we can both read and write Arabic, but not in the same way as in English. Additionally, we had the challenge of unpicking and unpacking the histories of our region that have been shaped, eliminated, banned, written and rewritten in service to and response to colonialism, religious sectarianism, and what a historian, Charles Hayek, recently put forward around 100 years of some type of war or another. So we have set the goal to read Arab and Middle Eastern work and, in, and to engage in art forms that are reflective of other ways of being within the region in the bubble of safety that is our friendship. That being said, we are aware that this sounds like one of the potential pitfalls, which is native nationalism, which is believing that decoloniality work philosophies and so on from our region is the truth or path that we want to follow simply because we are from there. And that is not our intention. Rather, we want to learn about this work so that the knowledge can exist in interrelationality with the decolonial work from other parts of the world, from which we also have a lot to learn from. Our learning and unlearning is also happening during a time of unrest, oppression, settler colonialism and violence back home and in our region. In a time of anger, thwarted revolutions, and as Mignola and Walsh pointed out, at a time where coloniality and modernity has become more complex with the increased power being asserted from old colonial powers and new ones. A Lebanese comedian recently jokingly said something along the lines of, we are confused. Do we keep using Western Union for our money transfers or are you, one faction of the government, going to bring in Eastern Union? And I think that clearly depicts the current struggles of power. At a time, similar to Ansari's reflection on decolonial design in India, the Lebanese and economic, the Lebanese and economic and political elite that are interlocutors of coloniality and modernity that established themselves during the time of empires are bearing down on people and stifling the beginnings of the colonial cracks. And at a time when we can't go home, not just because of COVID, but because of the defuturing that is taking place. With all of these things happening, we are finding ourselves continuously moving back and forth within, within Subgiriano's statement. Our rebellion is our no to the system. Our resistance is our yes to another possible way. As our anger pushes us toward to rebellion and our hope for re-existence otherwise toward resistance. And it is here that I see space for design. 
As I was experimenting with writing some data from Lebanon with decoloniality as an analytic, my anger wrote about wanting to overthrow the oppressive system, the corrupt political and economic elite. And one of my collaborators pointed out that isn't decoloniality more about existing otherwise? So I took a step back and reflected. She is right, it is. And Lewis Gordon and Jane Anna Gordon have talked about building our own houses within the master's house to dismantle it. But Audre Lorde has also pointed out that the master's tools may only allow us to temporarily beat them, him at his own game, but will never bring about genuine change. So sitting with these perspectives and feeling stifled with our houses being burnt down, I can't help but think that maybe we can design for both as the decolonial crops ebb, flow, and shift. Using Subgiliano's statement again, can we design for rebellion while embedding resistance during the times when our houses are burning? Can we design a space within rebellion and rebellious technologies for decolonial cracks where resistance can be? Additionally, Using the theoretical tools of our masters in itself can be a painful part of the unlearning and learning process. Several decolonial design theorists and decolonial thinkers, as well as critics of the humanitarian system, use Foucault's work on biopower, control, and governance as a lens to show the power of coloniality and modernity, of how humanitarian technologies are that of control. But recently, more and more articles are coming out about the harm Foucault did in our region, the sexual abuse of underage boys in Tunisia. And both Joelle and I struggled emotionally in grappling with this, and we still are. When reading about Nawal Zainab as Sadawi and reading her words of anger at how the master's tools that she used, Western publishers, contributed to some of her words not remaining true to her words in Arabic. When we are reading about how when she worked within a crack and gave a speech at the United Nations to talk as an Arab feminist, all the Western world took from her speech was the horrors of female genital mutilation and ignored the part of her speech about colonialism and capitalism. All of these are examples to say that we cannot simply jump onto the decolonial bandwagon but rather our decolonial learning and unlearning is a long process that is personal and painful, but it is not without hope and joy for being otherwise. Because part of that process is also finding the cracks, existing in the cracks, and thinking, doing, and doing thinking with communities. And so turning to design in HCI, we can see the cracks. For just like Musavi said, we must not make the mistake to assume that now that the bandwagon has arrived, we ignore all the work before. And this is not restricted only to decolonial thinkers, but also the ways of being and cracks that people have already brought into our discipline. For example, the refusal to surgically clean our methods and ways of designing with communities into workshops. The research bringing to the fore designing with Islam for sustainability. The research questioning why HCI for development and our research has worked within the confines defined by global development theories and practice. A systematic search of ACM digital library using the term decoloniality will not bring us these results. But it does not mean that they do not exist. For as I said at the CHI decolonizing HCI roundtable, the presence of people from what is termed the global south and our research has already started bring, bringing ways of knowing and designing otherwise. And now the decolonial bandwagon gives us the space, courage and language to further our practice. And we can see it happening with more papers that explicitly engage with decoloniality coming out. For example, Deborah Castro de Lille's recent JCSW paper and many more. And so I want to end on one last example. Earlier this year, I was invited to give a lecture on the potential harms of digital humanitarianism at the American University of Beirut as part of their humanitarian engineering program. I showed students this picture by Yasmin Darwish that depicts a basket on a veranda 
that I wanted them to reflect on as an innovation that is not only an example of local making, but also interweaves communal values, trust, and locality. Growing up, you would chat with your neighbors from veranda to veranda. If you found yourself in need of something that you don't have, like a thread of a certain color, you would drop the basket down to your neighbor and they would put the item in and you would pull it up. Or alternatively, they would drop the basket with the item down to you. When the electricity was out and you lived on the eighth floor and wanted something from the local grocers, you would shout out, drop the basket down to the shop owner with the money and a list of items that he wanted if the list was too long to shout out. And you would just trust that the shop owner would give you the right amount of change, no receipts. With the lecture being given in Lebanon and the basket being part of my life growing up in Lebanon, I did not explain to them like I just did now how the basket is used because I thought they would know. So I just asked them to consider what values are interwoven into the use of the basket. What sense of communal being within that pocket of urban space does it represent and bring to be? And compare it to the food aid technologies or even the gig economy delivering food around the city. And the response was silence. The professor on the program then spoke up and said, Reem, the students are not of the generation of the basket. This not only prompted me to reflect on my age, which it did, but question what is the new basket that, that's, that, that's used and is designed to, be, to, being, to enable being otherwise. Because as Tunstall highlights, culture is ever-changing as, as it shapes and is shaped. Therefore, I have to believe that the basket exists in decolonial cracks, probably not as a basket, but as something else that is of being otherwise. Because from the research that I've done, we see that people practice resistance every day, like in the refugee camps and settlements. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, yeah. I'd <laughs> like, I think, 